It's a kind of political version of the famous cynical observation from Morty the Mortician in the movie Chinatown. Middle of a drought and the water commissioner drowns. It's normally not effective to complain about coarsened, below-the-belt dialogue when the person voicing that complaint either abetted or launched that very kind of discourse. Nor is it particularly effective to assail name-calling by calling somebody names. But on our third story in the countdown, that is what former President George H.W. Bush did when he chose to describe me and my colleague Rachel Maddow as sick puppies. And it's even more unfortunate given the context the former president making the remarks on the eve of hosting President Barack Obama, who went to Texas A&M to laud Mr. Bush for his support of volunteerism and public service. President Bush had said that President Obama, quote, is entitled to civil treatment and intellectual honesty when it comes to critics. But in an interview with CBS Radio News, he had more to say about the tone of national discourse. Here it comes. I don't like it. I think the cables have a lot to do with it. I'm thinking back to when I was president, we got tons of criticism, but it didn't seem day in and day out quite as personal as some of these talk show people. And it's not just the right. There's plenty of people on the left. If you want me to name a couple of names, I'll be glad to do that for you. Go ahead. Keith Oberman and Rachel Maddow. I mean, here's a couple of sick puppies. And uh, the, the, way they, the way they treat my son and treat anybody that's opposed to their point of view is just horrible. Former president also said his son had been treated obscenely. It's hard to imagine anybody more civil, less obscene than my colleague and friend, Ms. Maddow. And as I said when I called into her show on Friday night, it's easy to understand how the father of any president might have a blind spot when it comes to how his son was doing. But consider the pre-W days. In 1988, the first President Bush employed Roger Ailes as a political consultant, basically in charge of the media message. In so doing, Mr. Bush became the father of the process that took us to the place we are now. They were the men who ran the notoriously offensive race baiting Willie Horton ad when Bush was running for president in 1988 against the Democratic nominee Michael Dukakis. And there was the scam on Dan Rather when then-candidate Bush pretended to be am ambushed by then-anchor Rather in an interview for the CBS Evening News. It was all prearranged by Mr. Bush and Mr. Ailes. And so the narrative arc goes right on through to the actual egregious non-news from Roger Ailes's Fox News. Aides of President Obama this weekend expanding on comments by White House Communications Director Anita Dunn that Fox News basically acts as a wing of the Republican Party. It's not so much a, a, a conflict with uh, Fox News, but unlike, I, I suppose, the way to look at it and the way we, the president looks at it and we look at it is it's not a news organization so much as uh, it has a perspective. And that's a different take. The only argument Anita was making is that they're not really a news station. If you watch even, it's not just their commentators, but a lot of their news programming. It's really not news. It's pushing a point of view. And the bigger thing is that uh, uh, other news organizations like yours uh, ought not to treat them that way. And we're not going to treat them that way. We're going to appear on their shows. Uh, we're going to participate, but understanding that they represent a point of view. Let's bring in MSNBC political analyst Richard Wolf, also senior strategist at Public Strategies and author of Renegade, The Making of a President. Richard, good to see you. Good to be with you. Sick puppies. Yes. I, I'm glad, since Rachel and I have been sort of both battling these respiratory things, I'm glad he's concerned for our health. But, but do, do you decry name-calling by... Mm. Name calling? Yes. Well, of course, we've all been called something worse than sick puppies in the last hour or two. But, uh, you know, beyond the irony, let, let's just take a step back here. Because, yes, it's understandable he's defensive about his son, but it, it's neither sick nor puppy like to point out that invading the wrong country, leading to unnecessary thousands of deaths, uh, isn't actually just name calling. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is something substantive there about what his son did as president and in his more reflective moments. And I think we can all agree that the 41st president of the United States is generally a reflective person. He should look at his own record in the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, and wonder why, not just because there were no cables in the same way, I guess he's not meaning underwater cables, mm -hmm. but it wasn't just the public discourse that led him not to face the same kind of criticism. It's that he operated differently as president, his son took a wholly different path, and created a whole ocean full of, sea pup of sick puppies. Would you agree uh, that there's no overstatement in this, that it was his, that when he ran for president the first time to succeed Mr. Reagan. He was the one who turned, he with Mr. Ailes, he with the ad for Willie Horton. These are the men who turned the corner onto the street about which the potholes therein he's complaining about. Right. Well, 
Uh, Karl Rove didn't come out of nothing. You know, uh, Roger Ailes begat Lee Atwater, who begat Karl Rove, and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. And we end up with tea parties. Yes, the discourse in politics changed. It coincided with all sorts of changes in the media. But the ads that they cut, the kind of campaigns that they established, led directly to 2002 and 2004. And, uh, it, you know, has it become meaner and tougher? You bet. But the, the politics and of national security, as it was played out, was established by this group of characters, and they came out, sadly, of his own administration. And you can hit those those low points. I mean, the next one that significant, I suppose, was the the campaign against Max Cleland. Right. And that's you know these are the these are the the, the stars that shine in this dark night that that, that that President Bush is complaining about and calling us this weird weird, weird term. But uh, 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 explain the White House, this White House versus Fox News, the rebound effect here. It, a lot of them seem unhappy about that. They were very <laughs> unhappy. And the quote, I mean, you buried in that Rahm Emanuel quote was the, the way the president sees it. Yeah. He's, no, he's, he's not just saying that they sit around and Rahm Emanuel's throwing things at the screen. It's not just him? No, it's not just him. And it hasn't been just him for some time. Uh, look, this isn't, uh, they've come to the understanding that this isn't just about commercialism. There is something deeply twisted about what's going on over there. And yes, look, people can dismiss this conversation as, uh, as some kind of commercial rivalry. But mm -hmm. let's look at how uh, this video has just popped up about Anita Dunn and her graduation ceremony of her own son. You know, this video, which was not available for public record, happened to pop up on the Glenn Beck show, and it's the same school where Chris Wallace spoke the year before because his kids also went there. Was that just a coincidence, or is Fox determined to take this to another level? That's not about news. It's about personal attacks. Look, they may enjoy it for all sorts of commercial reasons, yeah. but it goes way beyond the commercial aspect here. There is is uh, uh, an unholy jihad going on. But what is it? Is it politically smart for, to invest that much in this out of the, the administration and the people who work in the, that building there and the other one over here? Or is it? Did they just feel like they had enough? I mean, I'm not making any undue comparisons. But when I started down this path six years ago, it was because I had enough. I didn't right. know if anybody would. Yeah, if I'd be laughed at for pointing these things out, or there would be a financial gain in it, or not. As it turned out, there was. It was there to say, hey, this is. Crap. Yeah. Well, I, is that where they've come to? I think there are two things. First of all, yes, they've had enough, but they also realize that they cannot reason with Fox anymore. A and if you cannot make the argument, if you think the argument is not getting through because of some other ulterior motive or because there's just not rational thinking going on, then you don't have many choices. And that's where they're at. Richard Wolf, MSNBC political analyst and, uh, of course, of public strategies as well. Good to see you again, my Thank friend. Thank you, Keith. And by the way, for six years, I have suggested to my bosses that what Fox did was not news, and we should say so, that a 24-hour-a-day political info infomercial was not news, that there were three national cable news networks and only three, us, CNN, and headline news. So the White House has now done the heavy lifting. And guess what? We're number one. In the race for cable news supremacy, there is a new undisputed leader. It used to be Fox News, until... They're not really a news station. It's not a news organization. And that left one network standing alone atop the remaining heap. MSNBC beats CNN in primetime. MSNBC, the undisputed leader in cable news. MSNBC's leadership in cable news is widely disputed. Face closed. MSNBC, the place for politics. Our announcer Vic Starr in a promo you will not be seeing on most of these MSNBC programs. Well, I'm not really sure why not. Another one, stay tuned for My Beautiful Balloon, the reality series starring the Heaney family. Or stand by for the Congressman Jack Kingston Truth Hour. Worst persons ahead, and when Rachel joins you at the top of the hour, Congressman Alan Grayson of Florida joins her to talk about the Republican Party's struggle to find a candidate to run against him, despite the so-called common wisdom inside the Beltway that he would easily lose his seat after his outbursts of truth.